Hello, this is Bob Browner recording a case study of Lincoln Public Schools uh, uh, search to see if our staff positives were higher than community rates and if so, what was the problem? And so as uh, school went along, we've been uh, tracking uh, staff and student positive exclusions, things along those lines uh, over time. Uh, if you go to this uh, bigfile.lps.org site, actually it's available so anybody can look at it. It's uh, updated weekly. Uh, as we followed along, it looked like our coronavirus rates in our uh, students and, uh, and teachers mostly were reflected the rates in the community. And so the concern was, was it spreading at school or people were simply acquiring it from outside and they just happened to be school people, for example. And this appeared to be the case up until about uh, November. Uh, and so initially we thought, you know, the rates were pretty similar. Uh, some uh, a local PhD candidate actually was looking at the numbers and uh, sent me some emails and testified in the school board pointing out that actually as you got into November, uh, the, the rate of staff positivity was actually statistically significantly higher than the rest of the community, at least from what data could be gathered publicly. Uh, unfortunately, the data that was gathered publicly w wasn't quite comparable. And so uh, essentially, you know, yes, the, the community's rates were rising, as was uh, LPS, both staff and students. But the question, though, was this the similar population? And the answer is actually not. It's a dissimilar population. And to be really accurate, you actually need to do some age adjustment, for example. And so if you look at the uh, Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department website, you'll see that the younger age group, which happens to be age groups that contain teachers, actually have a higher rate of spread than the rest of the community. So comparing to community averages wouldn't be, at, wouldn't be accurate. Also, the date range was different. This is a cumulative date, date range uh, uh, number of cases since the pandemic started, whereas this is since school started. Uh, and so to get an accurate comparison, we needed a data a download with the same uh, date ranges and same age groups in order to do that. And so we started a project uh, with our health department to see if uh, we could figure out what was going on. Uh, and so uh, thankfully, uh, Tommy George, who's the uh, public health epidemiologist at Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department, put together a basically a comparison using the same day range that we were interested in, which was mostly the, mo uh, the month of November when our positives seemed to be higher potentially than the rest of the community, uh, broke those down into ages, which we could then back out our LPS population from that and see if it was uh, significantly different from the rest of the population. You'll notice that uh, uh, the age range that contains teachers, the ages of 20 to 64, is about two and a half to three and a half percent positivity rates during uh, this uh, date range. Uh, we then work with uh, Lincoln Public Schools staff to pull similar things and actually break it down into many subgroups. And so remember that two and a half to three and a half percent range. Uh, it, was there one subgroup where things were higher or was it across the board? Uh, what you'll notice is the middle high school and the other categories, it's about two 2.2 to 2.7%, which is actually the same as or, and or lower than the rest of the community. However, elementary school, something different is happening here. So 4.3% is higher. And so as a whole, there was a slightly higher rate. Uh, and, and when one subgroup, there was a higher rate. And it turns out that elementary school is where it looks like our rates are coming from. Also, is it necessary to do some age adjustment? So we did age adjustment on, on all those levels as well uh, to see what was going on. And of course, what you'll see here is that for the most part, it's across age groups, actually. Uh, anywhere from, say, 22 all the way to uh, uh, 60, there's a higher rate than the average in the community in those age populations. So something unique was happening at elementary schools, but not at middle or high school. So it looked like um, there was a one site where the problem was. Uh, so from context though too, uh, we did do some de-densification throughout uh, Lincoln Public Schools. So uh, parents were allowed to choose remote only if they wanted to and that rate uh, as a district is ranged from around 18 to 23%. Uh, it was a little higher initially as people got comfortable, more people started sending their kids into school. Uh, but then as our rates have gone up, gone up people have started been pulling some of their kids back out again. So elementary and middle roughly 80, 75 to 80% now of the kids are in, in, in school, but about 20 to 25% are not on average uh, as parents have brought their kids out. We have an A-B schedule in high school to, that was there to delimit spread. We'll see if we change that here in the new future. Uh, other interesting things, so as far as interpretation, uh, like a lot of things in epidemiology, the action is often in sub subgroups, assuming, we have, assuming you have the sample size to say that. So a word of caution, uh, if there's only, say, two people or five people that are positive, the sample sizes are likely too small to be that helpful. Uh, so we had to lump these all, you know, this is essentially 39 elementary schools worth of people, but then you start getting the sample size that there is some comparability. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, one concern, of course, is, is it in-classroom spread versus out-of-classroom spread? Well, if it's classroom spread, 
ed only, you would expect this, the, the teachers to have a higher rate than, say, the office and administrative staff. Uh, however, what you see here is, though, is that the office and the administrative staff are pretty comparable to the teaching staff. Uh, and so it, that would argue to me that this is not happening within the classroom, but someplace else for the most part. Uh, through contact tracing, we do know that there have been a few cases of spread uh, due to mass exemption. So you may have a kid with special education needs that can't wear a mask. Uh, there probably are a few cases there, a little bit high risk setting. Uh, and so it looks like from a case contact tracing, it's happening outside of the classroom, uh, in the back office, uh, break room, things like that, maybe in social settings. Interestingly enough, this is kind of what we see in clinics. So in my day job, I work with a, a lot of clinics across uh, Lincoln and the surrounding area. And uh, we've had uh, very few cases where a, a physician or nurse got uh, coronavirus from a patient. Uh, one case was a pediatrician, which you can imagine a pediatrician trying to look at squirmy kids uh, and having to look at their mouth and noses, just like the parents having to work with uh, potentially a special ed kid. Most of the clinic spread has happened in the break room, basically. And that's kind of human nature. Uh, a lot of the clinic staff like to socialize. They try to relax uh, between, you know, over the lunch hour, but that's also the time when people just naturally let down their guard. And so what we found is, you know, sometimes a nurse, for example, may have been exposed by her husband, uh, but then when, when she is positive at work, they were eating in the break room and exposed uh, two or three other nurses. Same thing happens within school settings. And it turns out, at least a perception amongst the LPS admin, is the elementary school's uh, staff uh, socializes more. And in any other time, that's a good thing. It's good for people to socialize. It builds teamwork, camaraderie. But a pandemic, that actually might be a bad thing. And so, uh, so it tells us where our problem likely is, that the good news is middle and high school, whatever spread is happening is community spread, not within LPS walls spread. However, there's something unique in elementary that we can do something about. So for those paras who might be working with a special ed, maybe we can give them N95s, face shields, try to work a little harder there. But we'll have to be a little careful in the non-classroom settings, just like in the clinics, we had to be remind people to be a little more careful in the break room settings. Uh, another subgroup that's kind of interesting actually as you look over here, uh, the uh, substitute teachers, which has been one of our challenges, they're not listed in elementary, middle, or high because uh, they can substitute in all, so they're in the other category. If you look at substitute teachers, their rate's extremely low, and why might that be? Well, one, they're probably being pretty careful. Also, they probably, because they're not uh, part of the elementary school team as much, they may not be socializing much, and that may protect them from that uh, non-classroom spread. But it's a good thing. It means that the in-classroom spread for these substitute teachers is extremely low, and that means it's probably safe to be a substitute teacher, for example. Uh, you might look over here and say, you know, transportation seems to have a little bit higher rate. However, that is not statistically significant when you actually run the numbers. Uh, but, you know, the short version of this is this is very helpful in terms of figuring out, do we have a problem? Are our mitigation measures in place? Are they good enough? Uh, if you're one of those hardcore statisticians, yes, we did look at age bands. So we took, uh, for example, all the LAPFs and elementary, uh, lumped them in by different age by their ages, uh, did a chi-square to see what was statistically significant. Uh, uh, most age bands actually were statistically significant. 25 to 34 was close, but not quite. However, when we lumped 20 to 44, it was statistically significant. So yes, there is a difference in el specifically elementary schools, uh, but this tells us, gives us a way to kind of monitor over time. And so the health department and the LPS staff have put together some spreadsheets where they can basically run these on an ongoing basis and see if we ever hit any changes. If we make a change, they say like, for example, go from a maybe high school to full, uh, do we see a change in teachers such that it's not safe for our teachers? And so uh, hopefully this is a good case study for everybody to kind of sort of do their little detective work and figure out, you know, is our what, was, what we're doing in schools safe uh, for everybody else? Um, so again, uh, the subgroups may help. You may need the help of a statistician or an epidemiologist. Thanks goes to the folks who put a lot of work into this, uh, Tommy George at the uh, Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department of Public Health Epidemiologists, and the LPS staff, Kirk Langer and Patty with the data and technology, Eric Weber and HR and Matt Larson and instruction, uh, had a very good discussion and I was very happy that the LPS uh, was able to do this. Hopefully this will be helpful for you as you guys think uh, other school districts think about how this uh, might work in their districts. And as, uh, as usual, of course, disclaimer in my YouTube videos, I'm a pretty opinionated person, but those are my opinions, not necessarily the places that I work or who I work with.